It's intermission time. It's great to get off to the moon. I'm going to quote you to you right now. <laughs> I'd read that you once said, if Hollywood wins with familiar formulas, indie films often triumph as a result of their originality. Do you think that still rings true today? I think you'd have to ask yourself, like, you know, just where is the indie space today? But in the true independent space, not to split hairs, I think absolutely. Like, I think independent work, non-corporate work, has always been kind of the uh, course corrector for taste. You know, that you can't help when you're inside a corporate system or a bigger ecosystem to start to uh, deliver like the house style, the house product. Because even though we think we're free, we're still driven by market forces and we want our films to sell. We want people to love them and we kind of shape it for that. And the bar, I think in the last, you know, 30 years, has finally got much higher. So people are aiming ultimately for more and more of the same thing. And then if you start to put on top of that the kind of change that came in the kind of pivot to global streaming, the dawn of the platforms, um, and their business goals being audience acquisition and their business tactic being a regular supply at a consistent quality, also translatable as similarity, you start to have an abundance of the same thing, redundancy. And in some ways, that's actually comforting for a lot of people, that mm -hmm. they know what they're going to get. Ultimately, business benefits in a environment of predictability. Mm -hmm. Art, however, is much more the, the equal and opposite reaction, the kind of counterbalance to that. And so I think when we start to overload people with sequels and prequels and kind of formulaic renderings on a constant basis, the, the creative spirit, which is in everybody, even if it lays dormant, starts to rebel. And they, they're like, I want something different. And difference might be a dish bet, best served with some familiarity, but it, it craves that originality. Mm -hmm. So I feel like when I look around now at what folks on all different spectrums and perspectives and backgrounds are doing, I see something bubbling up. And I think it, it will be the vengeful return mm -hmm. of originality. Vengeful return. I love that. <laughs> for the listener, do you want to tell everyone your full name, what you do for a living? And then I would like you to tell us a movie that describes your life right now. My name is Ted Hope. I identify as a film producer. <laughs> I've been an independent fil film producer for most of my professional life. I've been an executive for a good chunk of my recent life. But for the last couple of years, I've been producing again. And I would say I also uh, think of myself a bit as a... Uh, as the thing through many different words, but as a, both an organizer and an agitator, like how do we work together to build something better? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a mission for me. And the film, let's kind of say like, uh, I think I'm going to go with Jacques Tati's Playtime, that it is a uh, profoundly silly film about a ordinary man who is trying to understand just why is it so fucking crazy? <laughs> like, like, how come, like, we've developed in this way? And the truth is, like, as you watch him try to navigate the train, it's a dance. He's enjoying the confusion. He's enjoying the chaos. And he's able to, to laugh at the absurdity that uh, not really knowing like what comes next and what's around the corner or re really the reason why, but just having to go with it. And when I try to like, uh, in some ways I am the old man shaking my fist at the cloud, like, why do you have to be this way? But I uh, find that I laugh a lot more than other people. 
um, at least the folks I'm on Zoom with or talking or meeting with. And uh, I have a good time with the chaos that's out there. I kind of feel that sometimes uh, love is the brick that you have to throw. Um, and I do it with a good heart and good intentions that hopefully, you know, we'll, that brick will go through the wall and the light will come in. Um, that's kind of, I guess, uh, what, what I feel. And because in the end, you know, we have to laugh or else you'd have to cry because it's so sad. <laughs> Well, you can laugh and cry, yeah. <laughs> as I often do. <laughs> okay. Do you think your parents are the reason that you make movies? I remember reading that your mom urged you to watch The Grand Illusion. What were some of her favorite films? You know, we, we grew up in kind of a cultural dead zone. But it was only less than an hour from Boston. And like living in Los Angeles, I'm like, wait. It felt like a world away being 45 minutes away. You never go into Boston. It's, it's, you know, that's a day's journey. And yet you go visit your friend who's an hour and a half away on the other side of town yeah. in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my dad died when I was young and my mom was a, a college professor and, um, you know, wanted to go into the city and took us kids and we would, you know, see classic old movies and it definitely gave me a different perspective right from the beginning you know you can't you can't make jokes to working class kids about Gra groucho marx buster keaton and charlie chaplin they think you're weird <laughs> so you learn like i'm gonna keep that in the closet i'm not gonna let anybody see that um but that helps you develop the love and perhaps fetishizing uh that uh type of film i think my like, it's actually like, you know, when you said that, my mom just died, and um, I don't know what her favorite movie was. Hmm. And it, it it's, that's kind of shocking to me. It's like, I, I, for the last 10 years, I've been interviewing my mom on her life to, you know, uh, and getting the stories. And I never asked her, like, what her favorite movie was. Could you guess? But, well, I know one of her favorite stories was and i think it's kind of like where uh she both fell in love with my dad and realized that she was gonna like it was gonna be a tough relationship um that uh they both went to university of michigan and uh were and started writing film reviews for the school newspaper and they co-reviewed casablanca and she said like it was like a knockdown drag out fight between the two because he would rewrite her and then she would rewrite him and he would rewrite her and say all right you can't do anymore it's done we're handing it in and she she learned like yes don it's okay what time do you have to go to work okay okay don't worry i'll, I'll take care of it he goes to work she revises it puts it in submits it Got my review. <laughs> um and i have that review uh so yeah I, I would say like you know like what becomes you know, fa favorite of anything, you know, is so based on where we are in the moment, you know, and then people hold that favorite as a trotted out story for one reason or another. And it's often much more, what was your favorite context? Mm. You know, your favorite viewing experience, you know, my, my favorite movies, you know, there's a whole slew that I hold dear, but it's a different thing so often about the experience of seeing that movie. Mm-hmm. And I think that must have been like, you know, realizing she loved this man and they could argue and get over it. And she had ways she could try him. She found her match. Yeah. <laughs> Dream blunt rotation of filmmakers. Dream blunt rotation of, <laughs> of filmmakers. I would actually like, like, think like ultimately Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin. Like that would be like so much fun. <laughs> like that's it. Boom. Favorite film festival? I I have uh oh that's hard. There's like three I I have great love for Carlo Vivari in the Czech Republic. Um kids, students camp out in the hills to go see movies. They also a black tie in the the hotel you stay in is called Hotel Poop. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right? And it's where James Bond was for the original Casino Royale. And it has like a kind of lovely disrepair. And they have free bicycles, which you can go around. And it's a spa town. You can go hiking and then drink the lithium water if you so dare afterwards. So the and they they have all they have tons of great movies, beautiful, immaculate pers- uh projection. And the one good restaurant when I, I went like one year and then we didn't go back for seven years that we're in town. And when we walked in the door, they said, Oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Hope. Incredible. Like it was like, what? How do you know? like that was nice. Um I I have uh, also deep affection for uh Locarno Film Festival fantastic outdoor screening everybody comes out it's everybody together and says why can't we do that in los angeles in this great climate too it's also on this beautiful lake that colossal that you can swim in and there's a weird thing like they have a lot of top restaurants there but they all serve the exact same thing the menu is the same at every (laughs) restaurant like the preparation changes, but the menu is it's kind of curious. Um, and they've had a great history, I think, of a, um, a, a, of a unique programming or a little more cutting edge programming. And, you know, that the top festivals of the world often have to play the top filmmakers, whether they may want to or not, you know, that they can't be as some as adventurous. So I, I like that. The ultimately, like, I think one of the issues I have with North American film festivals is how dependent, and I know why, they are on corporate sponsorship. Mm. And it it starts to change the environment. Um, and how much the American film festival system has chased after kind of a market approach of needing, you know, to get the corporate sponsorship, you have to make the news. To get the news, you either need the stars or the sales. And so they become biased to that. And kind of as we were talking before, people start to create so that they can sell at that festival along that way. Mm-hmm. Like you, the, the whole American independent production cycle is so dependent right now on Sundance, it's problematic. I like the idea of uh, community festivals that are focused first and foremost on their local audience. And um, I've always enjoyed, and maybe because it was the one that was closest to New York City when I lived there, the Woodstock Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Like it has just like, I like its funky vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, um, obviously Woodstock, New York has a big historic cultural um, place and there's... uh, a fabulous uh, land art place where called Opus 40, not far from Woodstock, where a man spent his entire life carving stone into a, a maze and a labyrinth. It's like you get to go there, you, you know, you think of worshiping at the, you know, temple of cinema, the synagogue. The synagogue. You know, I've always felt like I'd like to have festivals that blend all the different art forms, you know, and if you had something that was a destination place, like say like the pyramids of Egypt or something like that alongside, so you could feel the solemnness, sacredness, you know, gift of creation that cinema is alongside all the better. So I liked like the first time I went to the Woodstock Film Festival, I also went to that place, Opus 40, and it blew my mind. So um, I have a nice association with that. Incredible. Have you had Ang Lee's cooking? I'm not in a very long time, and that's true. Like I, I'm, uh, I've got a bone to to pick with him about <laughs> that. You know, uh, I did have a meal with him uh, fairly recently. Like I, I did this kind of. Um, it was a it was a post COVID. I went back to New York and I met with all my old all the New York directors I used to work with and had a meal with each of them. And it was uh really unique to try to see like try to guess where the heads were at, you know, and just it what wasn't all of them, but like, you know, there's a world of difference between Ang Lee, Hal Hartley and Todd Solon. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh and they all have very different perspectives on the world and the business. 
you know, and he, but Ang always picks like a, not, he doesn't just pick a Chinese restaurant. They generally know who he is. Mm -hmm. And so you get like a special rendition of the food. One of the, like the very first time when we did his, his first film, Pushing Hands, the, the Taiwanese studio, you know, came to celebrate when we wrapped and we went to a restaurant in New York Chinatown in, in a, on Pell Street. And I'd been there to that restaurant and the food was okay. With Ang, it was fabulous. I had stuff I've never had before. And I tell people of that meal, like, you know, it was, it definitely ranks in my top 10 meals of all time. And it had things like black chicken, not blackened chicken, there's a dish, black chicken. And I think it may have been the first time that I saw a fight over who got to eat the eyeball. You know, <laughs> uh, and then we had like mountain grass and just all these different sorts of things that um, it was just such a lovely meal. And of course, it was it was complemented by full bottles of sorghum paste alcohol and shivis. And you had to drink both. And the glasses they poured were glasses, not there was a toast after everything, anything anyone said. Toast. <laughs> we walked out of there, you know, dizzy and feel like we could speak Chinese ourselves. You probably could. Favorite film of this past year? Well, it's been an interesting year for me for, for movies. And I'm not close to being done. I think I've seen, it's not been a peak year for me in terms of numbers of films. I do try to track what I see. And I'm running at like 50% of my normal consumption, which is now, it was at 250 this year, it's about 125. And that's because I didn't go to any of the festivals. So I didn't have those times where mm -hmm. I watched 30, 40 movies in the course of a, a week and hence where that goes. I actually, if I had to say right now, we'll see if it holds, like my favorite indie movie and I didn't have a, I didn't have the best viewing. I'm sorry, I saw it in in this way, but I was really blown away by the the movie A Thousand and One. Mm -hmm. um, I I hadn't seen it. I didn't. I spent. Uh, I was only in Sundance for my film Cassandra, In and Out, because my mom was dying, and uh, so I saw A Thousand and One on the plane, and I was just like deeply impressed and moved by it. Uh, in, uh, in excited by its courageous like leaps in, in time and its storytelling but every actor I thought was a fantastic um, point performance and um, I just I liked the, the way the film w was made so that was like a super exciting indie uh, film for me um, I'm on the jury at Woodstock and I saw a couple good movies there but I can't talk about okay them. Um, maybe when the camera's off you know I, I i have i have to like i don't think my my number one film of the year has surfaced fully yet i definitely have had great movie going experiences i think my number one movie going experience this year was bellatar satan tango if you know this movie mm -mm. seven hours long Seven the hours. The movie is seven hours. Seven hours long. It was packed. It was up at the Arrow here. At the the, the Did people American pack Center. lunches. The, the people had bags of food like naps, so you could hear the rustling all the time. I literally, because originally they weren't going to show it in uh, New York, the film that doesn't get screened that much, and Bellatar, the director, was there, and he's not of great health, but. Literally, I had a friend like fly in who was so excited, you know, to to see it, and that got my wife to to say, "Okay, I'll 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 join you." And there's definitely something like when you do that endurance test, you know, you get dizzy, you're drinking too much coffee, you're eating too much sweets, you like, yeah, you're stoned. It it was fantastic. And <laughs> what's interesting, like, so I did three of these like slow cinema long screenings this year. I saw uh, uh, the the Chantel Ackerman, uh, Gene De Deleman, and um, also uh, Akapong Werethal, <laughs> Uncle Boomy, uh, who can foresee his past lives, like all three hour plus movies all slow and sold out 
packed and I'm twice the average age of anyone in the audience. <laughs> it was like a 30 and down crowd at all of these. New York, I saw Uncle Boonmi with Hal Hartley and we were surrounded by young, beautiful people and we were like, holy cow, what's happening to this world? <laughs> it was, you know, Santa Monica is a, you know, people, it's a gray haired audience here, but not for that movie, not for the seven hour, you know, it was, you know, rock t-shirts. And um, and same place I saw Gene uh, Delaman too. Like they were all, it was it was so counter. And I, this is some of the why I think there's uh, something bubbling up and about to surge. You know, Hollywood is like everyone's fast cut, short attention span. You got to like overload them, overload them. Someone should be out there taking the folks of the cinef the, the opinion of the cinephiles who show up to see these movies. Mm. I don't know where they come from, how they know about them, but they're there, avid and rapt attention. When when the movies end, nobody gets up. They stay hoping for the Q and A. Um, so that alone gives me great hope for for cinema. That's beautiful. I have to see this movie. The yeah, it it is. It's bleak. It was part I, of. That's like my the, vibe. I love that. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Like, I remember I have a son who's like uh, 20, 22 years old. But when he was maybe like seven or eight, there was that movie nine. I think it was an animated film. Nine came okay. out or something. And I remember him talking to uh, my wife's mom, his grandma. And uh, he she was like, oh, Mike, this movie nine. I think it was called nine or something or eight or something is coming out. And he said, yeah, it looks grim. Do you think it's grim? I like grim. <laughs> you know, can I see a grim movie today, Ted? <laughs> um, yeah, that the the Satan Tango was part of Bleak Week. Oh. So you know, if you're looking to get get, get know, bleak, <laughs> yeah, they got it. Do you have a favorite genre of film? Yeah, I I have a favorite genre of film. I would say my favorite genre of film is ambitiously authored movies with attitude. I want somebody who is reaching far beyond their own grasp and willing to like say, fuck you, don't tell me what to do. Like that's my favorite type of movie. Something that will make my jaw drop at some time and say, I can't believe they went there. Mm -hmm. And that isn't just like, so often I think like Americans in particular think that has to be like aggressive, like mm -hmm. transgression has to be aggressive. But like a movie like Jacques Tati's Playtime to me is that, and it's a delight. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you can get to that place too, I love it. Mm -hmm. I would filter in if you really want to start to say like favorite, favorite, favorite. Like the what I would describe as total cinema. I like filmmakers, and it's really hard, and most people should never try this at home, uh, who actually are able to fire on all cylinders, on all aspects of cinema, right? So you see that they're in control and thinking about everything, every frame. Kubrick would be the uh, main go-to, I think, for that. And then people would say David Fincher today. But like right now, uh, Park Chan-wook, for me, uh, is doing that several times over. And the last wor couple of films, you know, which aren't as um, sensational as uh, the ones that came but before it, not that they were necessarily sensational, but not as like make your jaw drop stuff. Decision to leave and The Handmaiden, both I think are exquisite. I love you know? The Handmaiden. I was so like, it ranks when I was at a Amazon, we got to acquire that film and kind of put, put it in context of how much things have changed. You know, that, that movie, I was really pleased with it. My mom tried to watch it and she called me and she was like, Ted, this is pornography. I can't watch this. I can't believe you told me to watch this movie. Um, I don't want, <laughs> I'll tell you a story on the <laughs> later. The, uh, um, you know, mom's not easily shocked, but uh, th that did shock her. But, but yeah, that movie, like, so, so complex on many levels and witty. Yeah, always, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I actually think Decision to Leave, too, is actually has a lot of humor to it, even if it has that kind of vertigo Hitchcock 
tone. Totally. Yeah. What one word would you use to describe independent cinema? <laughs> um, I wish I could say independent. Right? <laughs> you know, the, I, the one word I would use to describe independent cinema is dependent. Mm. That's been incredibly dependent um, on the existing ecosystem, on the work that it's come before it, and certainly always on a communal aspect. You know, like more than any other films, those movies are collaborations. It may have a director of, you know, real genius and intelligence at the, the helm, but because most independent films are f full of crime, that they're that it's a crime to make these movies because that's the only way you get them done. <laughs> Somebody's being exploited beyond the legalities of the, the system. Uh, it only gets done by people who are there aligned and willing and wanting to, to make this thing happen and be made manifest. Mm. Um, I think that there could be a lot more like a, it's like what words would you like to be able to use to describe if you could if you could describe your ideal independent film in one word, what would it be, Megan? Ideal. I wish we had a freaky cinema now, like you, the horror film. Like, like mm -hmm. uh, I loved Barbarian, you know. Yes, also uh, another movie that's scary and funny. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and also like a lot of the South Korean films, Parasite and and going way back um, to like there's a good history of it. Always surprising, like when you say what? you can't do that. Oh my God, they just did it. Do you ever see this movie, um, Save the Green Planet? Mm -mm. Watch Save the Green Planet. Okay, add that, it to that's my list. a freaky movie. Not really scary. It doesn't actually go into it, but it's just like, wow! I can't believe you went there. Mm -hmm. Like I remember at that point in time too. Like somewhere there was a Japanese film called Tetsuo. Mm -hmm. Do you know that movie? Yeah, it's just like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love a fucked up movie. Yeah, I wish we could make fucked up films mm -hmm. now like it's so hard to the system like we've gotten so good and everyone is so well trained you don't get those kind of gloriously bad movies mm -hmm. anymore and i think that's why a movie like barbarian is so surprising like it's like you're not allowed to do that mm -hmm. or that or that right it's like wow and it's so thrilling mm -hmm. and i think in all culture people are always hungry for for that yeah, the best word is transgression, that that violation of the rules in a really fun and enjoyable way. And the problem of global enterprise is it crushes that down. Mm. You know, um, you, we've depended, I think, on a lot of international, regional, localized cinema to deliver that sort of stuff. Uh, and as we become more global, I'm afraid that might get what gets lost so we should start a mission mm -hmm. to like bring back fucked up films mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i completely agree and there's a large audience i'm sure that wants that it's it's interesting right now like the you know transgressive directors of the 90s todd solon's vinnie gallo harmony Corinne, you know and so on are are almost more popular now than they've <laughs> ever been they're selling out their screenings like people are really interested in what they're doing, even though like they would say, yeah, no one will give me money to make a movie, but the audiences are hungry for that at the same time. Mm -hmm. This episode of Intermission is brought to you by The Silent Partner. I don't know how you managed to pull it off. Well, I guess you're gonna have to tell me one of these days. Kill you, so help me, I'm gonna kill you. Starring Elliot Gould, Christopher Plummer, and Susanna York. One night when you come home, You'll find me on the inside, and that'll be the night you'll wish you'd never been born. It was the only way to make him the silent partner. Coming to a screen near you Hello. in the year 1978. Hello? Do you have the physical copies of all the movies you've produced? I used to have prints back in the day. Like, we used to, uh, you learned early on, that there were always excess prints made for every movie. And so we started getting that in our contract that we had the distributor had to put together the best possible print, which often was made up of several prints 
for us, like for the DP, for the director, for me, for the right. And so we all used to get 35 millimeter prints of our movies. And uh, my life worked out in a fortunate way that by the time my companies were gone and couldn't store those for me, I actually had enough money to have a house that had a basement of my own to store them in. Um, I couldn't actually afford that place. And so I had to leave New York City at a certain point. And it was filled. I probably had like, you know, 40 different prints of my movies at that point. I didn't know what to do with them. Um, and uh, But luckily, the University of Wisconsin-Madison agreed to take my archive. Oh, that's incredible. And uh, which included, you know, all my files and all my stuff. And um, and it was nice because it was both where, where my business partner, James Seamus, had his and my wife's grandfather, Walter Wanger, had his. Um, so it was like, oh, old home week. Um, I probably still have, so I lost the, the, the film prints. I probably still have VHS tapes of every film I made up until the point. Oh, I love that. That's you know? sweet. Um, I'd like to think I had all my DVDs. I'm thinking of taking the DVDs out of the garage and getting them back into the house because I'm kind of thinking I need to go back to DVDs. Like, I cancel all of my uh, streaming except for Criterion and Amazon recently. And I'm thinking, like, like I have probably... 300 unwatched DVDs. So that oh, will like oh, wow. keep me going for, for some time that, that maybe I could just stop watching. Like I, 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 it's true. And I joke and this did happen um, probably over 15 years ago. I'm in the shower. Don't picture it. It's not pretty. <laughs> I'm in the shower and I'm thinking, of the movies I want to see and the lists that I keep. I keep a lot of lists. And I'm like, holy cow. I've now reached a point that I have more movies on my to-watch list than I possibly can consume if you at my maximum rate of consumption, which was then you know between 250 and 300 films a year, um, for my life expectancy. Like, there's no way I can watch all the films that I've already identified that I most likely will like because I put them on my list for one reason or the other. So I actually, I don't need any new cinema because I have all the, these films that I already want to see. Is that comforting or depressing? It, it's funny. I so remember where a close, like, I was like, you're weak. I, I, I found, thought it was such a profound <laughs> discovery. And I told it, uh, that there was this uh, couple that you know we were friends with, both filmmakers, and the guy was just like, Ted, that's so depressing. <laughs> I have to, I don't understand why you're excited by that. And, um, and to me, like right there, that's a reason to live, right? Like, like I will never be bored. I can always, like, I know what I want, mm -hmm. right? And it's easy to get, mm -hmm. it's not hard. And then you factor in all the books and music and things you want to eat and places you want to go and like you're never going to run out, right? It's an ample supply. This is, you know. But beautiful. then the question, but then the question is, why do we need new cinema, right? And that's actually really key, and it speaks a lot about what we need. All the filmmakers working today have something that Kurosawa, you know, Godard, you know. You know, name your favorite filmmaker, Jacques Tati, uh, you know, uh, can't ever do. Not only because they're not dead. I, you know, those guys are dead. The filmmakers win one. And they win the second round because they can make movies about today, right? And that's what we want so much from movies is, like, what is it about living our life today that is unique and remarkable and timeless, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that kind of cultural relevancy is such an important factor. You know, um, one of the things that, why the movies have so much conformity in them and redundancy in them is the, the mechanism often that's used for things like studio green lights is comps, right? Competitive analysis of uh, other uh, films before, comparable an analysis in this case, actually. And, you know, oftentimes that was like, oh, it's in a genre like 
it's a star that's done this, a director that's done that. And you're actually trying to replicate past success. And it had a huge effect, I think, in the industry. One of the reasons why there's unequal gender representation and racial representation is because of these comps, because the history of cinema in America is mostly made by old white guys. And if you're trying to say, oh, what films were successful? Oh, wait, 95% of them were made by old white guys. That's because that's all who made movies, right? Mm -hmm. But once you start to factor in cultural relevancy, about people want a movie that's about today, you know, that becomes a bigger factor that opens the door for a lot more people to tell. Because we frankly have enough movies that are about directed by old white guys or starring old white guys. Mm -hmm. Even though it's those report polls say people still want to see 70 year old men, you know, as actors more than they, you know, falling out of airplanes than they do anyone else. Tom makes me Cruise. think of the <laughs> it makes me think of the movie uh, Bottoms that I just saw like that that wouldn't have been made 10 yeah, people, years ago. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it. I, I, I like Chiva Baby a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people are really excited precisely about it. But my understanding is that, like it's still pretty much a, um, you know, like a group comedy formula, although told with the people you aren't usually seeing. In that yeah, formula. exactly. Exactly. Who is the most famous person in your film book? It's hard to say, uh, like, I. there are people I'm working with that I admire greatly, but we haven't achieved what we're aiming for yet. And I don't believe in publicizing <laughs> what I'm working on until it's ready. Because, it, you know, the truth is, like, why would you ever publicize development where generally it fails? And you want it to kind of, you want to be willing to take those risks where it fails. But like still there are times when my phone rings and somebody, and I get giddy because they're heroes, you know, for me. Um, I'll tell you one of my like uh, early days, like most exciting times and those sort, sorts of things. Um, before there was crowdfunding. There, there was a fantastic uh, New York actor named Ron Browder. He was part of the Worcester group, which Willem Dafoe wa was in. And he was in tons of movies, uh, but he was a character actor. This was probably early 90s, early 90s. And he had AIDS, and he was going to die. Mm. And he had a very famous, uh, well-regarded one-man show on Roy Cohn, who was... Uh, like Nixon's henchman during the McCarthy mm. trials. He was Donald Trump's lawyer for a while. He was a, a gay homophobe, <laughs> right? Like, go figure, right? And the other side of the, the uh, char character in Ron's play was, was Jack Smith, who was in some ways the father of performance art and did these long evolved, you know, kind of drag show, weird things that people didn't know what to make of it. And so the, these two, con the play was these two contrasts in identity. And um, Ron very much wanted to have this made into a film. And a, a friend of mine, mentor, guide, uh, uh, filmmaker, Jill Godmelow, very much wanted to make it. But uh, Jonathan Demi owned the rights along with uh, Film 4. And Ron was going to die. And so Jill called me and was like, Ted, you got to convince everyone to give us the rights. And then I think we can make it for like 150 grand. You got to find the money. We got to shoot in four weeks because Ron's health is so bad. And uh, basically it all came together. Jonathan Demi, one of the nicest men in the world, was like, sure, go forward, make it film for it was like go go forward make it uh, and then we started cold calling people and i was on a trip i think i was going to the um, puerto rico film festival when i arrived in puerto rico at the hotel like literally i'm checking in and the phone rings and they say ted hope and i said yes michael stipe is on the phone for for, for you rem was one of the biggest rock bands at the time they were one of my favorite rock bands. I didn't know Michael Stipe. And somehow he found me in Puerto Rico and was calling me on the phone. 
And I was like, holy cow. And I it was like, I got to take it in my hotel room. I remember jumping. I'm talking on the phone to him. And he, <laughs> he, he was telling us he would give us money and he would get the rest of the band to give us money. Jumping up and down like, oh, my God, I'm talking to Michael Stipe and he's giving us half of our budget for the movie, like out of the blue. It wasn't totally out of the blue. A friend who was working on the movie was friends of a friend and da 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 One of the first people, first like famous people, one day um, we had started our company. You know, we were doing little low budget movies, um, barely getting by. And the phone rings and it's like, Ted, yes, it's Francis Coppola. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> I hung up the phone. It's like the phone rings, Ted. It's Francis Coppola. You have to take it. And he called us and said, like, I know what you and James are doing. I like what you're doing. Will you guys come have lunch with me? I was like, wow. He realized what we were like. How did that happen? Um, that was when I realized really my ideal office would be an Italian restaurant. I want the round table in the back. Oh, yeah. You know, I like, love that. Just like That's when the vibe. meeting's done, you just slide over and you finish your plate. You know, spaghetti. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's ideal. What do you think is the most underrated position on a film set? Well, I'm going to go with, with production assistant. I was a production assistant for three years. I met some folks who became directors. While I was a production assistant, I was also a producer. I wasn't successful getting my movies produced, but I was trying to uh, produce. And someone, I wish I could remember who told me this. I think it was like an electric, like early in my career. So I'm on like probably second job and I'm clearly bored as hell. And I'm just standing like scuffing my feet. And the guy walks by me and then comes back and says, do you know what your job is? And I go, yeah, I'm a production assistant. But you're just standing there. I said, yeah. Your job is to prevent the accidents from happening. You should find where the problems are and stop them before we see them. And then I was like, what? Huh? And then it, that, that became my, my eye. It was like I was looking around. Something's going to go wrong here. What could it be? I have to find it. It's kind of like a where's Waldo, mm -hmm. you know, of, of problem solving. And I think the folks that are, are going to be the future producers and the filmmakers who are undervalued on the set are super active. Their minds are alive. They're thinking like both about like who's doing what and how do I become that? They're thinking, where's the problem? How do I solve it? And they're thinking, if I was making a movie, this is what... It may not all be related to the film we're working on, but they've got a lot going on. And I, you know, that's probably true with, with, with anyone along those lines. I'm always amazed, and my definition of this won't be the same as everyone else's, by beautiful lighting. <laughs> like, I've spent a ton of time on set, and I still don't know how people achieve it. And when I watch, like, particularly when I watch, like, a low-budget movie that, you know, you can look at and you can say, oh, this movie was made for $2 million. And not only is it well-composed, boldly, you know, captured in the, in, the, in the shots, but it also has beautiful lighting in it somehow, even if it's natural lighting. I'm kind of like, how did, how, did they, how did they get there? Mm -hmm. um, the truth is, though, the most underappreciated people on all film sets, when they're good, are the producers. Mm -hmm. That's who that is. Like, like no, nobody knows how much time, work, energy, collaboration goes in. Now, the challenge is not all of them are good producers, but mm -hmm. and a movie can be flawless and not necessarily well produced at the same time. Uh, but when you have a collaborative team. And the the one of the originators and executors are one of the producers. Generally speaking, that person is, is not thought of correctly for their co contribution, um, and generally the industry has issues with recognizing what they do. Mm -hmm. The crew doesn't like it. 
I miss being in New York, I have to say, because we, we got to make movies in New York City uh, at a time that there were some special contracts that allowed us to make movies cheaper. But it meant that as a producer, you had to give half of your back end to the crew. And we did like six films um, under that contract. That it was a, uh, I, I, uh, no, it was a, it was the IATSE low budget agreement at the time, um, and uh, we paid out profits on three of them. And when I was working all the time in New York, and that crew was coming up and still in the all in the business, people would come up and was like. You know, Ted, it was you, only your movies ever paid us profit. And I still get my check. It's only $6.12. <laughs> but, like, it's so great to remember, oh, we actually own a piece of that movie. So you kind of gave three people. We have the PA, the producer, and lighting. Yeah, and I could keep going. Like, like <laughs> Everyone. Like, you know, it, it's interesting. So I have a movie opening today, Cassandra, uh, Gael Garcia Bernal, uh, in a true life story of the first gay lucha libre Mexican wrestler who was allowed to win, right? And it's a beautiful movie. I am so happy with it. I'm so proud of it. And it is the work of many, many people. Roger Ross Williams directed it, and Gael is perfect in that, in that role. But that movie had its ass saved 227 times by different people in every place in the chain. And so many different times on that film, it could have cracked and broken, including the studio. Like if the studio didn't have faith in its Amazon uh, in the team and stood by us and believed us when we said, we have something incredible here, it's beautiful, but we don't yet know how to get there. We need your patience. You got to sit with us for a while. We don't have much to work with, but we're going to get to this place. We're going to get, you know, and they stood by us. And when we needed more money for the to hire the composer who we knew would be right, Marcelo Zervos, and he worked for, with us for a break and delivered an incredible score that lifted the movie up. Like each and every time you just see, holy cow, holy cow. How does, how do you, you know, like we think, Movies are about orchestrating things going right, but it's actually often about being flexible when things go wrong because mm -hmm. so much went wrong and broke and it required somebody to capture it before it totally shattered and somehow lift it to a next level. You know, like there isn't like that whole that whole crew should all have like medals and badges saying I was a hero and I looked at this movie. <laughs> like the unfortunate the unfortunate thing of uh, you know a film by credit is it's uh, it has many authors. Like like a good meal has many cooks. Like there are many it's it's Roger's movie. We wouldn't be there without him. It wouldn't be what it is without him. But like so many people save that movie at the same time. Mm -hmm. it, it's just lovely, you know. What is a movie that first comes to mind that made you cry? I always talk about movies that make me cry. <laughs> I like to think one of my brands is I make grown men cry. That, that you I need make that on movies, a shirt. I make movies that make grown men cry. Even like I was very proud of that in Amazon. We did Manchester by the Sea. That movie made me ball. Yeah, Ball. and next to like, and I love hearing stories. So I'm like, I was sitting next to this totally beefy guy with like a trucker hat on, and the movie ends and tears are coming down his 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 face. But also movies like we did uh, Big Sick there too, mm -hmm. which also made people cry, and it's hilarious, totally. right? I was devastated when I saw Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love. Mm -hmm. I saw it in Toronto at the film festival, and it industry screening I was by myself I think I was coming to the end of my first marriage if I wasn't coming to the end of and I've only had two just I'm in <laughs> my wife and I have been married for 20 years but uh, uh, I might have been newly single at that time but 
when I saw that movie, I was convinced of the impossibility of love. Mm. That like it would be next to you and you wouldn't be able to to find it and achieve it. It was always going to be just out of grasp. Mm -hmm, next door. Wrong timing. <laughs> exactly. And in the end, you're gonna have to speak your pain and your loss into a hole in the wall into the wall. Right. And just like I was just and then like when I left the theater, uh, I encountered some a, a woman who I kind of had a little crush on, <laughs> and she spoke, and I just was like, ah. <laughs> I was like, excuse me, I gotta go cry. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. It's a great answer and a great movie. And just you just hear the music, and it still like makes you well up. I have a playlist on Spotify of songs that make me cry, and most of them are from movies that have made me cry. So I wanted to see where you stand on this. Uh, do you think you would be where you are now if it weren't for NYU Film School? Um, I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for New York City mm. Film School. In that being in New York when I was in New York, which required me to go to NYU, is like right place, right time, super exciting and gave me kind of the energy and foresight and discipline that I needed to make movies. It totally helped that uh, I got to have some great film classes, Godard, Brazilian cinema. There's a documentary uh, professor, Brian Winston, who just showed kind of avant-garde, you know, helped me really understand documentary film form. And Sight and Sound, uh, which is their intro to filmmaking class, was, was key. I'm not so sure that it was the... And I can't say I s could see through what was the academic uh, discipline and design of the institution at that time. I was an angry, punk, punk-ass kid. <laughs> at that point in time. And I wasn't going to learn anything from anybody. That wasn't like where my head was at. There, I, I appreciated, I had a uh, experimental um, cinema teacher, a Abby Child, you know, who opened my eyes to certain things. I appreciated that. Um, but mostly I was angry and nothing was going to change that any which way. Um, and New York, like I had enough foresight to recognize that's going to be more accepted in New York City than it is Los Angeles. I had a huge gift in that when I, I transferred in and on the very first day of film school, when I was considering dropping out, it was my last class of the day, um, We were there was something happening and uh, we were supposed to be like critiquing work and giving, and I was just so like... Nobody knows what they're talking about. Like they just praise for praise's sake. Uh, then this woman spoke up in the back of the class, uh, Anne Carey, and she was smart. She was witty. She was uh, precise. She looked really cool. And I went up to her after class, and she 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 just like put up a hand. And I was like, "What?" She was, don't ask me out. And I was like, <laughs> "I'm not asking you out." Um, she sounds badass. <laughs> you know, well, she became my business partner for the rest of my life uh, all across different things. We collaborated on tons of things. She uh, joined at, at Good Machine um, and head of development and became a producer during that time. And then when we started This Is That, she and Anthony Bregman and Diana Victor were my business partners after that. So, um, and um, she's an awesome producer. Um, has a Persian version opening up now and uh, did the, the Rachel Weiss Dead Ringers series mm. um, too for Amazon recently. Uh, but yeah, so like to, to meet those folks, like that's one of the main reasons to go to film school is your cohort, right? And um, that, that there were other good folks, like also in that grouping was uh, Joe Beanie who is Werner Herzog's editor and Allison, um, Andrea Arnold's editor and Lynn Ramsey's editor and a director unto himself. My roommate, who is also in film school with me now, is no longer in film as a judge out here. 
but at that time to have those people that you're getting to to talk about cinema mm-hmm. with nonstop like I could do this all day. This is my favorite thing to do is to talk about <laughs> movies. Why do we make movies? So we can talk about them, right? Or is it vice versa? I'm not sure. But um, yeah, just like that, that is a whole part of learning. And New York City is the best place to see movies in America, at least. Like they're so accessible and there's great culture and it never, never has dipped. Theaters close down, you know, the type of programming shifts, but there's always something wild to see there. I think from your book is where I read this, but did you really see Spike Lee outside selling tube socks? Yeah, well, it was it was the trifecta I hit. Like, you know, you I didn't just bet on that pony. I got all three. It was such a gift to be in New York City at that time. And you have to, uh, so I think I get there, it's 1983. And um, I was flat broke, right? You know. uh, The start to any good story is you're broke, I think. (laughs) Flat broke, like literally like, you know, all all of our furniture came off the street. Some of our plates and dishware came off the street. Um, you know, we were, it was a race to pay the, the rent all the time. And I had th- this incredible apartment. I had a three bedroom apartment up by Columbia, Broadway and Riverside, 605 West 111th, 4D, I think it was the apartment. And three bedroom, um, one bath, tiny bath, tiny bedrooms, but $900 a month. Right. And we had five of us living there. Right. So like it it worked. Um, And during that time, like so um, New York wasn't yet what it is now. um, But you could go two blocks in, knock on the gate, put 10 bucks in and out came a, a bag of weed. So when we would do that as students in those days, there weren't green grocers everywhere. And you had to walk like literally 10 blocks to have a, a grocery store open at 1 a.m. And we would always see the same people in the grocery store, you know, contemplating those questions. Crunch berries, <laughs> Fruit Loops, Crunch berries, Fruit Loops. So when I scrounged up enough money to buy my first uh, ticket to the New York Film Festival, I had to decide between Stranger Than Paradise, which looked really cool because that guy had this gray pompadour he looked it looked like a really cool movie you knew it won a prize at can and what was described as like a blood-soaked southern gothic james m kane you know uh splatter opera and i chose that one because i knew strange in the paradise was going to be opening at this movie theater like that next week and i'd be able to see it that way so i got the cheap seats which was second row so I got a clear look when they brought out the director, the producer, the actress. And I was like totally shocked because it was the people who were trying to buy the Fruit Loops that I wanted every weekend at the Green Grocer. It was Joel, Ethan Cohen, Joel and Ethan Cohen and Fran McDormand. <laughs> and I was like, holy cow, it's that trio of stoners, you know, from the Green Grocer. And then I went to see. So I saw them up close and I was like, wow, they, they kind of. Not quite like me, like they've made a movie, but like they still are buying their food at 1 a.m. Um, when I went to see Stranger Than Paradise, I got accosted going into the movie theater. Like this guy, you know, it's just like, I don't want your flyer for your movie and like ch- calm down. And I sat down in the movie theater, trailer comes up and it's filmed in front of the movie theater. And it's the next film that's going to play there. She's got to have it. Mm. And the director in the trailer is selling tube socks. Spike Lee. And I pick up the flyer and it was Spike Lee. For it. And I was like, wait, what? Like the movie that I'm watching now just happened to me in real life? I was, it was confusing and wonderful, right? Like there he was. And then literally like three weeks later, I get, because I'm living up on 111th Street and I'm going to NYU downtown. When the subway doors opened, Jim Jarmusch was standing right in front of me. <laughs> and it was just like, holy cow. 
this city is so small. These are the people who are doing exactly what I want to do. And they walk on the same cement and ride in the same subway cars, go to the same movie theaters and, you know, uh, shop at the same green grocer. Like, holy cow. And that sense that it's something is achievable, mm. right, it is just remarkable. And like, you know, we knew, I think, uh, uh, Blood Simple was made for a couple million. Stranger Than Paradise was made for a couple hundred thousand. She's got to have it was made for a couple ten thousand, you mm -hmm. know, like it, and I was like, wow, maybe may like we never thought someone would give us a million dollars, but maybe we could raise fifty thousand dollars, you know, like it, it made it all seem like it was possible, and it turned out it was. Another question I have for you, um, I think I read this on a Reddit thread where you did it like an Ask Me Anything. And you said there was a naked lady that showed up on the set of mm. Doom Asylum. Can you tell us about that? It was actually Luminous Motion. Oh, okay, okay. It was Luminous Motion. <laughs> um, such Bet a funny... Bet Betty Gordon. And I think we were filming in Staten Island. I'm not 100% sure. But, like, you could find these beautiful old Victorian... It might have been, you know, out by Coney Island the Rockaways or something. But you can find these great, beautiful Victorian uh, build houses that had been abandoned. This was such a scary place, I'm now remembering, that you know we were able to buff it up so it looked like a, an actual livable house. There was a room in that house that evidently the people that had homesteaded it, squatted in it, put... Why you know, uh, lost dogs? What he you know, uh, homeless dogs into a room and locked the door. And the inside of the room was clawed at dog level because the dogs were trying to find a way to get out and they couldn't get out. It was like, I in some ways like the the remnants of something so terrible. Like it was just, you know, you, I hadn't imagined that. And then that same night, so then we're realizing, trying to figure out, like, why the room and what and what it was. It's like radio comes out, Ted, you got to come out and help. What was it? And it was a homeless crack addict without any clothes, wandering through the set, taking the craft service. You know, you put a safety blanket on her. She was like, get this off me, you know? And it was just like, now I understand our world is entirely surreal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, that's what, how, where, where, that, where that happened. But there were other things too, like, uh, like in, those, in the scheme of things, uh, when we were doing 21 grams, uh, Alejandro, uh, found this location that he desperately wanted and it had been like one of these homes that migrant workers lived in 30 to a house right and it was it, it had you know you could tell not good things had happened in there but it was exactly what he wanted for his location so we worked out a deal with the city and we agreed to take everything out of it and when they took everything out of it there was a rolled up rug mm. and inside the rolled up rug was one of the people who had at one time lived there. Insane. You know, um, there was also like I'm just remembering when like those stories. This isn't a movie, but it's like yeah, twice I've uh, narrowly missed the rolled up rug. When I moved to New York City, and we were trying to like go essentially dumpster diving to furnish our our home. Um, you know, you learned what day they put out all the furniture and big stuff, and it was right before like a. Uh, school was back in session and so my roommates and i went to see what we could find you know if we could find some chairs and that sort of stuff and we saw this perfect rug on like you know it was in a good neighborhood like near near columbia and you were like wow it looks really nice maybe shane was like let's go find what we need first and then we'll come back we don't need a rug came back the rug was gone next day in the new york post students you know take a rug back to their apartment unroll it and find a cadaver. That is a movie. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Insane that you've had two of those experiences. 
narrowly missed. Yeah. Like yeah. that one was le- yeah. thankfully delivered by a newspaper. Yeah. I wanted to ask you what is the best pitch you've heard, movie pitch, and potentially worst if you're willing to share. I actually haven't uh, thought through like what the best pitch really was. I was I was incredible. Like I I was frustrated when I was at Amazon by the quality. Like because at Amazon people brought pitches all the time, and as an independent producer, you hear pitches, but you don't hear two or three pitches a day. You know, and know your executives are all hearing as many, if not more. Um, so it was a, a different cadence and experience. When you hear a pitch as an independent producer and you love it, you're like, okay, I'm going to work with you and we're going to go find the money. When you hear a pitch at Amazon and you love it, you're like, okay, here's $10 million. Good luck. Go make it. You know, like yeah. it's a little, it's a different sort of vibe. Um, and I was always amazed about like uh, there's some people who are incredibly prepared, but they were prepared in a rehearsed way. Mm-hmm. You know, they they did their work. They might be really good at it, but you were aware that what you were seeing was a performance. And I think like the best pitches are actually good storytellers who know how to have a conversation, and they make you feel like you're a human being, just like they are. And that you're relating, and that you and they are somehow aligned, and you know they'll have your back and you'll have their back, and everything's gonna get be even better than you thought, right? That's like, I think when everything's working, it's like, wow, something just happened in that room. What wasn't? Michael Mann is very gifted at that. No wonder he's been able to have the the career and opportunity, like. You know, I was intimidated by him because his movies are fantastic and he's like been like right on on what what he does and like he he's contributed significantly to the ultimately the the pop subconscious to the cinema cinematic language that mm. is today. There are things that are directly invented, you know, words, sentences, paragraphs invented by him. So I was intimidated. But like he was like Ted, and he just like leaned in and started talking to me, and we started having a conversation, and then it was about the movie without me re- really recognizing when the pitch began and when it didn't, like where the where the lines were, and he made me think beyond the script, and you know he was guiding, and I I just ate it up and just went <laughs> hook line and saying I was like man I want to make a movie with that guy. I know he has a reputation for going way over budget, but we connected. We connected, like, because there was something there. Like, he was, he's gifted. He's gifted at that. Um, the what, you know, I'm going to have to come back to you on what was, I'll try to figure out what was the absolute best. I would suspect that, like, the best pitch. Well, I it wasn't so much of a pitch, but it's definitely one of my favorite Hollywood meetings I've ever had. I had just seen uh, Jim and Andy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? The Chris Smith documentary, yeah. uh, Jim Carrey playing Andy Kaufman. So good. And Jim Carrey came into the office. And it felt like a uh, another level of that movie. Like, he 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 was the Jim Carrey in that movie of a deeply philosophical, soulful man that had lived one life and changed into another. And, you know, but you weren't quite sure whether he was also Andy Kaufman at the same time, too. Was he still like method acting at that point? He was like, uh, you know, that movie was made long after he had done the, the role for which yeah. he had played Andy Kaufman. Um but the interview sequences, Jim had had a really big beard and he had a really big beard when I met him. And he was saying how somehow like inadvertently the the film, some of the films he did uh, 
his philosophy leaked out and sometimes the philosophy leaked into him and how that what was the movie and what was his life was in conversation and it was heady and i loved it and if he had said right then like uh i want to make another movie just like the one i made word for word but it'd be one thing different and it's going to cost us x million i was yeah yeah let's do it <laughs> let's do it i i was really excited i think it's tragic that uh, he's retired now. I also think it's tragic that the audiences wanted him always to play the the funny guy, and like his greatest work, I think. Like I, when I saw Men in the Moon, that that film, I saw the first screening of it. I thought it was going to be the biggest hit, the most uh, successful movie. It was exactly what I wanted, and I was so excited. And then I think the next day the reviews were bad and uh, it never became that. But I still loved what that movie was. And, you know, and of course, Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind, produced by Anthony Bregman and Steve Golan, Anthony X business partner, um, great friend, perhaps the best movie made in the last 25 years. I absolutely loved. Or whenever it was made, like, uh, oh, you made me remember one of my favorite pitches. Okay. So one of my one of my favorite pitches ever was um, there's a director. Uh, he's actually one, a fantastic uh, video artist now, Marco Bambilia. Like if you've ever been to the Standard Hotel in New York, mm -hmm. they have you go up in the elevator and they have the those um, composite uh, imagery of many movies of different things popping at you. Um, Marco makes the the that's part of Marco's art. If you ever saw like the Ye or I guess then it was Kanye Power video, that was Marco's work. Marco came to me and said, "I want to do Philip K. Dick's Flow My Tears." The policeman said, um, which is a pretty wild book. And you got to meet this kid I just met, Richard Kelly, the director of Donnie Darko. He hadn't done anything yet, mm. maybe. 21 years years old or something and they came into my office and laid out which which like now like when you see something say say like everything everywhere all at once th this like you would expect someone to make what they pitched me after you saw everywhere everywhere all at once and that it was okay there are 17 different realities and our characters are slipping through those realities and they have to figure out where they are to get back to the one that they're in like that's kind of the and he had a a, a you know diagrams and maps of where the characters were and how we would track what those are and if you've ever read any philip k dick you know who wrote scanner darkly and uh you know the android stream of electric sheep which is blade runner mm. um uh True lot not true lies. Uh, oh, there's a ton of a ton of stuff that's been made from his movies, including uh, Man in the High Castle. Mm. Um, it's on my watch list. Yeah. I have to see it still. Yeah, but you know he he was an amazing uh, thinker, and this book was like literally they they finished the pitch, and I'm in like a full fledged acid trip. Like my mind has been blown. <laughs> I have no sense of where reality is. The walls are melting. I'm not who I was. I've been <laughs> reborn. I've lost my sense of identity and reality. And it's like, will I recover? It's like, wow. It, so that was a pretty good pitch. That's incredible. I absolutely love Donnie Darko. It's, I, like I said, I love like a mind fuck kind of like a, you leave the movie or like, what on earth did I just watch? Yeah, it's one of my the, favorite feelings. Like the, I, the genre, going back to what's your favorite genre, like the the uh, the mind fuck movie. Like I was, try I wanted to do a few of those at, at Amazon. And Richard, of course, we brought him in, and he had a a great great idea that just wasn't quite right, and we couldn't quite get it to where we needed it mm -hmm. to be. That also was a brilliant idea that he had mapped out really really well. And there were some weird little excursions, and maybe they were okay, but we didn't quite get there. We never made it, but it was awesome. I want, I want him to make more movies. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure a project like that will maybe will resurface in the future. I hope so. The problem is like, also like, 
you know, because we all live in the same world and we all get the same inputs, people take elements, not consciously from those sorts of things, but you see them produced. And like, there's always like a collection of scripts and movies that had they got made in the time that they first originate would have actually changed things on the planet, mm. I, th I think, you mm. know. Um, and then you see this other little piece get made in one thing and another little piece get made in the other. And particularly in that genre, it was something like Black Mirror, you know, being, you know, so, you know, the, the form of what many people, it's like, oh, that movie is too much like Black Mirror and so it's no longer fun. Mm -hmm. for people uh that reminds me when you say that is um the did you see the latest season of black mirror i saw like the first four episodes yeah did you watch the one with the two guys who go out to space but it's based on a book uh yeah the one that's like a feature length uh um, so now there there's a movie coming out that's also the almost the exact same premise because i think both are referencing the same book yeah yeah i and i've seen that movie too that hasn't come out yet yeah I with paul mescal yeah, right? yeah yeah Faux, yeah and it, it's true when i watched that episode i i'd been in a uh work in progress screening for foe and i was like this is really similar to that yeah. movie I saw. Yeah, yeah. And the timing's unfortunate that the movie's coming out after the fact. Because that was my first thought when I watched uh, just like little clips or the trailer or whatever for yeah. Faux. I guess we haven't covered this. What filmmaker have you not worked with yet that you're dying to collaborate with? The dead ones. <laughs> All the dead ones. Um, that is a sound bite and a half. The... Uh, it, it the 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 filmmakers who I haven't collaborated with are the ones I'm working with right now that I'm super I want to make the movie but I don't talk about that yeah so that's so, exciting though you've yeah. reached that point you're with the people you wanted to work yeah with. well sometimes they're not initially like that one of them my most favorite part of the process you know it's a tough dance to decide as a producer, am I going to commit to this project? Like I'm on the verge right now of committing to three new projects. And I basically said to myself all of three weeks ago, I'm not taking on any more projects. And I'm now here I am three weeks later about to take on. <laughs> Can't resist. Three, and, and some of it is, is like, there's that inkling of something that you like and you think this will be a, a new journey that will somehow help me understand who I am um, a little bit better and the world really will want to need the, this movie. And the truth of, the, of any film is like, you're gonna be lucky if it, if it gets made in three years, right? It's gonna take longer. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really feel and trust that there's something in your collaboration and in each other that's going to remain interesting, exciting, and not painful. And when you take that leap and you start in the work and the person surprises you in a positive way, like, oh, you guessed right, it's really exciting. It, you know, you understand, like, in that, like, there's a problem always in film that people fall in love creating stuff because it's so exciting to create stuff. And I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. You know, like you don't, um, I'm, I'm married to a filmmaker. We make a, we've just made a movie together and we've survived it, you know, but, um, but that, that I think it's the, headiness the delirium the pleasant delirium of discovering somebody else and seeing how what you provide and what they provide lifts each other up it is something that that people have been trained to think that that's romantic in nature and it isn't necessarily romantic we just subscribe it to being romantic but if we actually said like that process of collaboration um is really what it's all about like that trying to get to that place where you're out on a limb not knowing what you're doing mm -hmm. next and somehow what you do lifts the person up to something else and it's like i didn't know i had this in me 
and we're so much better for it, it's thrilling, right? So I'm at a place where the couple of projects now where the script is almost done. And in this, and I say almost done in that we've said it's been done like five times and we keep taking it to the next thing. But like in that moment where you keep making something better and you you kind of say like, oh, I knew this was going to happen. I picked right. I knew this was going to happen. This person is capable of. There are people that I'm working with that haven't, you know, come close to doing what I think they're capable of. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that I'm going to be the one that gets them to make their signature work. They're defining the thing that is most like them that they didn't even know was like them when they started down the road. Mm -hmm. I find that whole process like incredibly exciting. Yeah, you have to have so much intuition. And, you know, you're you're nudging Mm -hmm. often and then you're seeing with someone, you know, so it's kind of a, a, of a dance. Um, And there are processes, right? Like it's not unguided, but like there's a filmmaker that I'm working with now. We, I have a very long development method I like to use. And um, she said, like when we were getting like the fourth cycle of it, of, of like, she said, Ted, you knew this is where we were going all along. And you held back on that note because you knew if I you were going to say it to me in the beginning, I would say, no, we're not working together. And now I say you're right, and I'm going to do that note. But you knew it. You <laughs> knew we were going together. I said, time and place of everything, right? Like, you know, all in good time. Like, it may not have been the note I gave back, you know, unless things went this way. But things went this way, and now it's clear. Mm-hmm. I. I think like the there I was talking to a friend about uh mystical aspects of uh creation and development. And I'm not a religious person. I'm a non-believer, but I lo- I love I think creative work is a show of faith. And the devotion, the love that we put into it is this great commitment of it's a commitment right that like filmmakers ask me often like you know like how do you do it it's like five six years we're not getting paid we're getting doors slammed in our faces nobody what what's wanted and i was like you should look at how great it is to be in service of something bigger than yourself you want to tell this story you are making the sacrifice and you are doing this act of devotion you are worshiping at the synagogue, right? Like you are getting to say that, yes, I have faith that we're going to get to this place that's going to justify everything and justify hundreds of people working with us and giving us millions of dollars to, to do so. And I don't know yet where we're going. I guess, but I just don't know. Like we're going to find our way ultimately. and. The, the fact is, like, so far, generally speaking, not always, I've been right. And we've been able to get to, to that place. I've had a few. There, there's a filmmaker who goes uh, unmentioned who's, you know, had a very successful career. And we were going to do something. And we got into my thing. And he's just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, this isn't development. Like, tell me, like, what do you want me to fix here? And I was like, I don't know. But we got to find it. And he was like, I can't do this. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us five stars on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to follow our Instagram at It's Intermission Time and share with your friends. As always, Intermission is produced by Duzil Chu and Olivia Deaton, directed by Caden Laroki, and of course, hosted by yours truly, Megan Braun. Be sure to say your prayers and visit the synagogue on all platforms. Oh,